Welcome to Brazil, Church of the Nazarene. We're here to seek him, celebrate him, and serve him, our Lord Jesus Christ, this morning. We've got some guests with us today, but we're going to start with Shrek. He's going to give us an announcement and uh, to get us started this morning, and then I'm going to open with prayer, right? Because you're doing scripture later. Yes, yes. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, just good morning. And he's calling out my shoes, my awesome Shrek Crocs. So, yeah, I know. Huh. But uh, yesterday we had teen Bible quizzing down in Mackey. Uh, normally, like, we give you guys some results of how we did. And yesterday was kind of an exciting day. Uh, we went down there. We had six quizzes representing our church, and five of the six were all in the top half of the standings, which is pretty cool. Uh, so uh, I want to point out Noah Hefner back there. Uh, his second quiz ever got 12th place on the day. Uh, and then Elissa's younger siblings uh, got 10th place, 7th place, and 3rd place um, <laughs> representing the church. Uh, and then also um, we had Noah and Ethan and Griffin, who actually won the C bracket for the day. So we have a nice little certificate back there. So there's more, yeah, yeah. And uh, Elissa's siblings were on a team, and they lost in the finals for gold. So they got second place on the day, which is pretty good. All right. And uh, the last thing, if, if you don't see any announcements, I don't know if it got there, because I didn't tell her. Uh, but we do not have youth group this week, and we also do not have Bible quizzing this week. So, cool. For, because of fall break, yeah. All right, there's something that I forgot to put in the bulletin, so I would like to amend that. Um, if you did not sign the card that Wendy had at Sunday school, she would like to see you after church, and she has a card for you to sign from the whole church, so if you'll do that. Also, if you would like to help pass out candy for the city trick-or-treat, um, we will probably have a meeting this Sunday before that's in a couple weeks, just to get things organized to see where we want to set up and how many people are uh, planning on coming and being with us to give our church a face and a name in the community, and we hope to do that. And we hope you can come and join us. If not, some of you have already started. You can bring us some candy because, um, if you'd like to donate because we will be servicing a lot of children. But we can um, pass out a lot of smiles and a lot of Jesus love. Thank you, dear. <laughs> Again, we welcome you to church today. We have some special guests with us, which is all of you. And then we have a couple out here in front that you probably haven't noticed before. At the piano is Sage. On the drums is Caleb. And on the microphone is Amy. We are excited to have them here all the way from Olivet Nazarene University to help us worship today. And uh, Amy's a freshie. And this is her first time ever. So, to do this. So she's excited. These two, they've done it like four times, so they're old hats now. Anyway, but we're glad to have them here to help us lead us in worship. Caleb will be speaking. Keep them in your prayers throughout the service and through, you got prayer cards. Keep them in prayer throughout the year. Uh, God is trying to do something in their lives that they would just listen <laughs> and obey. And he's already getting them to respond the future of the Church of the Nazarene is moving forward with leaders like this. We're excited to have them. Let's open our service with prayer as you guys stand, and then they're going to lead us in worship. Lord Jesus, we bow before you today. We offer you our thanks and our praise. You are worthy, Lord, of our worship. And we are privileged, Lord, to be part of the family of God to let you know today, this first day of the week, that you are God and we are not. Therefore, we bow before you today and surrender to what you want to do and what you want to say in our lives and, and teach us today. So God, thank you that we have this opportunity to give ourselves to you today. 
to seek you, celebrate you, and serve you. Be in our worship today, in Jesus' name, amen. If you guys want to remain standing as we start worship this morning. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. <laughs> the life I now live in the body, I live by faith through the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. She could have quoted that too.
There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. And every war he wages, he will win. And I'm not backing down from any giant. If you want to remain standing and keep praising as you as you will, um, we're gonna have the three ambassadors lead us in this next song. Um, so just keep praising with them, uh, and it'll just be those three over here.
Well, church, if uh, we get started this morning, um, I just invite you uh, to pray this morning. Whoa, that's fun. We're going to open up and whisper some prayer this morning. So let's bow our heads. God, thank you for this church. Thank you for this place that we can call family. And God, thank you that we are part of a group of people that serve a God that is not just a God that's distant, but a God that's in every situation that we go through. Thank you for being a God that heals. Thank you for being a God that listens. Thank you for being a God of love. God, I pray during this time that you would open the hearts of all of us um, and just let these words be yours. Let me just be a vessel for you today, God. And would you just allow us to hear what you have for us this morning. It's your name we pray. Amen. Well, church, it's so good to be here today. And uh, a part of this program, so we are from Olivet Nazarene University in Bourbon, Illinois. Um, so we were part of the Preaching and Music Ambassador Program, and part of what that is, if you don't know, um, it's just a chance for college students to get the opportunity to start leading worship and start preaching from a young age in the college setting before we ever have to do it on our own someday when we graduate. So we appreciate you, and from me, myself, this trip's a little special for me because I grew up in Bedford, Indiana, about an hour and a half from here. So I grew up on the Southwest Indiana District, just as you guys are a part of. So this is a special time for me just to get to be a part of another family that I've grown up with on the Swid District. So this is an awesome opportunity for myself. A little bit about, more about myself. Um, I'm, from, I'm a sophomore at Olivet. Um, I'm studying intercultural studies and sociology. I also have a minor in Spanish. So my goal someday is to do social work overseas, um, partnering with schools um, and churches, hopefully, and just work with teens and kids um, overseas someday. So that's part of a little bit more about me so you guys aren't just a stranger about this guy standing up here talking to you. Um, So today, if you'd like to turn with me, we'll be starting in Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4, and we'll start with verse 1. I'll give you a second to turn there. This is the word of the Lord. Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel. For the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land, because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. They employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore, the land mourns, and everyone who lives in it languishes. Along with the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky, and also the fish of the sea disappear. Yet, let no one find fault, and let none offer reproof. For your people are like those who contend with the priest. So you'll stumble by day, and the prophet will also stumble with you by night. And I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because you've rejected knowledge. I will also reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. This is the Lord, word of the Lord, and we say thanks be to God. Well, aren't you glad you came to church this morning to hear these encouraging words from Hosea, right? No, I promise we'll get somewhere, and this is not just a Debbie Downer sermon. But I'd like this passage just to sit with us this morning. This sense of just unknowing, this sense of hurt from God. I'd like that to sit with you as we travel through looking at the character of God in the book of Hosea this morning. So a while back, I'm going to be honest, I was on one of these trips a while back, and I get to the house. It's my first trip ever by myself. So I get to the house, and the first thing they do, I get to meet these three daughters, and they were incredible people. And I walk in, and they say, guess what? We've made brownies for you. Now, I don't know about you guys, but brownies are like, if I'm ranking my desserts, they're really far up there, like really far up there. So when I hear homemade brownies, I'm thinking, yes, best weekend ever. Because like, I haven't had homemade brownies in a while. I'm a college kid. I'm not making brownies. So like, this is my opportunity, right? So um, we're eating dinner, and the whole time the brownies are just sitting on like the counter right next to us. So I'm like eyeing these brownies. Like the food was good, but like, what about the brownies, you know? Like, that's, that's where my head is at this whole time. And so um, we, get, we get finished eating, and one of the girls looks up and goes, guess what? I was like, what? And she goes, it's time, and you get to have the first brownie. I said, yeah, I do. Let's go. You know, like, I'm so pumped. And so we, she, she scoops it out. She puts it on my plate, and I'm looking at it. I'm like, well, we'll see what happens. You know, these brownies, they could be good. I, the, at first look, they, they were a little suspect, but I was like, they'll be good. Like, how could you ruin brownies? So I, I put my fork in, I put the brownie in my mouth, the first bite, and the girls were watching very intently because they had informed me that they made the brownies. And they're like 12, 10, and 5. So like, 
they, they're really expecting greatness here. I, I'm going to be honest. So I, I, I bite into the brownie, and then I quickly realize after first bite, I've got to become like the greatest actor ever because these may have been the worst brownies I have ever had in my life. I am not going to lie. It was bad. And so I'm looking at the girls, and I'm choking it down. I'm like, oh, what do I do here? Like, do I lie, or do I just, like, subtly tell them? Like, what do I do here? So they're like, so how is it? I'm like, well, you did it. You made these brownies. They're like, yeah, we did. I was like, whew, yeah, you did. And so the girls then, like, after they see me eat it, they, like, have to quickly, like, bite, get a bite for themselves. And watching the middle girl, who's the most, like, excited about this, and she bites into it, and all of a sudden her face like, is experiencing all the emotions I just went through. I'm like, oh, she understands now. She, she gets it. I was like, now I wonder what she's going to say, because I'm a little nervous here. She's going to be like disappointed. But instead, she kind of chokes it down, gives me this look like, hmm, yeah. And then she goes, you know what? I made those. I said, you know what? Yeah, you did. We never talked about how they tasted, but she made them. So we're going to visit that later. Uh, I promise we'll get back to that later. But um, as we open up the book of Hosea, and we come in contact with God. And when we see God, God is extremely frustrated with the people of Israel. Hosea at first glance can be a book that causes a lot of confusion and just a lot of just unknown to the people of God. Like, what do we do with the book of Hosea? But I think when we look into the context, when we look at who God is for the people of Israel, we get this beautiful depiction of who God's character is a little bit better when we just take the time to go look at it a little bit closer. So in this book, God uses Hosea to tell the people of Israel the pains that God is causing. Hosea gets to experience some things that gets a little bit of a glimpse into God, what God goes through, and you know, it just doesn't look like the best situation at all. But, and so, God, in chapter 4, starts laying out to Israel all the pains that Israel has caused God. And so we see that the people, there's three things that the people are lacking, which is this. The Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land because there's no faithfulness, no loyalty, and no knowledge of God. There's just no knowledge of God because the people of Israel are lacking these qualities. And then God says, you know what, I'm so frustrated and then he says, since you've rejected and forgotten me, I will forget and reject you. Wow, that is some heavy stuff we're dealing with, right? Like, what, what is God talking about? He's forgetting, rejecting the people of Israel. We're going to get to that. I'd like us to play with this theme of God as a parent and the people of Israel as God's children. The children, God, Father, right? Parent connection. So um, this morning, I like to talk to you parents at first. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to give you parenting advice. I have no place to tell you about how to parent. Not me. But I think you guys are going to be able to connect with God a little bit more when we bring this into context. So I'm just going to ask here, parents, how many times have you looked at your kids, or maybe back then when you had your kids at home, you maybe told them some instructions. Maybe you're out in public or going to the mall or going shopping. You gave them just some ground rules, like this is how you should act. And then you get there, you maybe, or maybe it's like someone's house and a play date. And then, they, like, the second you get there, it seems like the kids just do, like, everything opposite of what they just told you, right? I'm sure all of us have been there, right? I mean, I was once a kid, like, I've been on the side of the, the maybe don't do what your parents told you. And at that moment, I feel like parents, maybe you get a glimpse of what God was talking about. Maybe you're a little frustrated with your kids. Like, did you not just hear me, right? That was like five seconds ago. So parents, maybe you maybe get a glimpse of maybe God's frustration. Like he's like, these are my children. What did I just tell you? And then you go do the opposite. Or maybe those of you who don't have children, maybe you're like me and have been that rebellious kid once, and uh, maybe you know the wrath it feels like from your parents. It's like, good grief, them again. Like, maybe you can be able to connect with the Israelites maybe in that situation too. So through the whole Old Testament, we continuously see God try to lay out some ground rules, like, this is how you should act. You just got out of Egypt. I'm going to help you along. What does it look like to follow God? So God lays out some ground rules. But without fail, the Israelites tend to fail almost every single time. It's like, what are they doing, right? Like the Israelites just continue to break this covenant relationship with God. The children of God, the, the Israelites just don't listen, it seems like. So God, understandably, is a little frustrated with his children. Like, this is my creation, and they just won't listen to me, right? And so then we get these consequences from God. I'm sure parents, 
when your kids don't listen, you probably at least lecture them a little bit like, good grief, come on, would you just listen to me? I'm trying to help you out, right? I think we get the same from God. God's like, hey, I'm trying to help you here, right? This is what I'm trying to do. So God lays out some consequences to get the people's attention. So we see God's heart continue to be broken by the Israelites. And here in Hosea, it seems like God has just allowed, lost it all. He's on the very end, and he's just about done. However, we, God doesn't just end in chapter 4. God doesn't end with throwing in the towel and be like, all right, see you guys. No, that's not what our God does. So if you'd like to turn with me to Hosea chapter 11, we'll pick it up with verse 1 in chapter 11, if you'd like to turn there. Chapter, one, or chapter 11, verse 1 reads this. When Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. The more they called them, the more they went away from them. They kept sacrificing to Baals and turning incense to idols. Yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I pulled them along with cords of a man with ropes of love. And I became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws. And I bent down and I fed them. We're going to move to verse 8. Verse 8 says this, How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, Israel? All my compassions are kindled. I will not carry out my fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim again, for I am God and I am not a man. The Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. They will walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. Indeed, he will roar, and his sons will come trembling from the west. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt and like doves from the land of Assyria, and I will settle them in their houses, declares the Lord. Here we start to see the character of God laid out just a little bit before us. God lays out all these feelings that Israel has provoked in, in himself. We see this shift from God in the middle of chapter 11. We see this shift that God is clearly frustrated. He is like, what are you guys doing? And then we see... God is just overcome with love, right? We see him, God overcome with mercy for his people. And so then God says, you know, I am not human, but I am God. I'm not just going to end with kicking you to the curb and just leaving you there. That's not God. And so then God is overcome with mercy. And by this fact, God is in love with his children. And we see this dramatic shift. He says, how can I give you up? You know, you're my people. These are God's children, despite the people continuing to break God's heart. Yet God is still overcome by love. And has, he has this love for his children because God shows mercy first. Even though the people continue to break God's covenant, God is still sitting there with love and open arms, ready to welcome them back into a relationship every time they mess up. So even though the people haven't figured it out, God loves them. God is waiting for the day the people decide to love God back. And God has all the right to punish the Israelites, right? They have, he has all the right. They have done nothing he's told them to do. They've done all the opposite. And yet, God is overcome by mercy. And he doesn't just throw in the towel. God tries to get the intention of the people and then simply just waits till the people recognize God and let the love of God has for them to be a mutual relationship with the two of them. And this is where we start to get a glimpse of God's character in the book of Hosea. In Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 through 7, God tells Moses about the character of God. It's like where we first start to get a glimpse of who God is in the Old Testament. And um, he says this, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in faithfulness and truth, who keeps faithfulness for thousands, who forgives wrongdoing, violation of his law and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, inflicting the punishment of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. This is where we start to understand the emotions of God as seen in Hosea. Yes, there are consequences for the people's um, actions. But yet, before all of that, we see in Deuteronomy that God says, you know what, oh, above all that, I'm going to show you mercy. I'm a merciful God. I'm a loving God. I'm a God of faithfulness. And this is what we see. So, I, I want to bring us into this. Let me ask you, have you ever been afraid of God? Have you ever been afraid of God? I think often in Christianity, we, like including myself, struggle where we constantly live in the fear of God. What's going to happen to me if I do something wrong? Like, what's going to happen? 
And then this results in us living in this way where we just are like, I'm so afraid of messing up that I must live completely contrary to everything that everyone else do. I have to like act and speak and dress in a certain manner so God won't like destroy me because I'm afraid that's what's going to happen. But I don't think that's what God's really wanting here. I think we see God, he's like, no, 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 this is not about just how you act. It's about this relationship I want with you. So yeah, there's good in putting boundaries on ourselves. Sometimes we have to do that. But it's different for everybody, right? So our whole basis of how we act shouldn't be our whole basis for Christianity. Moral codes in Christianity, that's not like the top priority here, guys. And those boundaries are going to look different for everybody. We have this other side of fear. Some of us live in so fear that we have to live everything like completely opposite of everybody else. Other people just feel so inadequate. They're like, how am I supposed to ever live up to this expectation? So they're like, well, there's no, there's no point in me ever trying to live up to this. So they're just like, whatever, I'm just going to do it my own way. Because they have no other ideas that God is actually beckoning them into this relationship of love. So yes, it's a healthy idea to have a fear for God. It's important to understand that we serve a God who's greater than everything. But yet, that's not where it all starts. I think God is saying, you know what? I want a relationship with you. Rather than having all these moral codes, I'm beckoning you into this relationship. So it's not about the way you act or dress or speak, but it's about falling so in love with God that everything else just seems just undesirable now. It's not about, oh, I must dress this way. No, it's about falling so in love with God that anything else just seems weird. That everything else in the world is like, you know what? It's okay. People are okay to live their lives as they want to, but I am so in love with God that nothing else matters. It doesn't matter how I dress or speak or act. It's simply that I'm so in love with God that the love of God pours out of me and everyone just sees the love of God through how I live, right? That's Christianity, I think, in the book of Hosea. That's what God is trying to do for the Israelites. He's saying, you know what? It's okay. Just come into a relationship with me. That's all I'm wanting here. I want a relationship with you. And that's what God wants of us, right? We can put ourselves into the people of Israel and we, because we're all considered God's children, right? So I think even today, I think, I think God's just saying, hey, you know what? I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you do or how you act. I want you to fall so in love with me that everything else is just undesirable because you're so in love with who I am. I will show you how you'll live and I will show you what your character should be. And from that love God has for us is this love that pours out of us. And then we are able to love God and love others greater, right? That is what we're called to do in the first place, right? So I think back to this girl with brownies. I told you we're going to get there eventually. Everything within her wanted these brownies to be so good. And she really was a good salesman. I'm going to be honest. Ten-year-olds are really good at sales pitching. Um, but yet, these brownies let her down. I think... She, but she yet still took pride in them. When she bit in, she knew they weren't good, but yet she still said, they are mine. I made these brownies, right? So how does that connect with God? Well, I think God, when he looks at the people of Israel, when he looks at us as a creation, he says, oh my goodness, this is not how I made you in the first place. He's like, you guys are doing terrible sometimes. You just, it looks like you've just completely lost it. But yet, that's not where it stops. He said, instead of saying, oh, you guys are bad, this tastes bad, you guys are bad. No, God says, I'm going to take pride in my creation. I made these. These are my people. This is who I made, and I'm going to show them love and mercy and take pride in them because this is my creation. Now, are we going to mess up? Yeah, we are. That's just, that's just how we are. We are humans. We cannot live to the, to the expectations completely that we might put on ourselves of God. But yet, we can still live in this freeing relationship knowing that God loves us so much that when we, we might make a mistake, when it feels like we kind of just are just burnt out on everything, we still have a God who's saying, I made you, and I love you, and I have mercy on you, and I'm going to beckon you back into this relationship with me, and we're going to keep journeying together every single day. And that's the God we serve. And yet mercy doesn't just stop with God. We have this command that we're, we're called to be into this char the character of God. We're called to model our lives after the character of God. Of God, So mercy doesn't stop with God, it, but it also begins with us. So it doesn't stop with God showing us mercy, but we must become a people that show mercy to those around us and start being that living example of what it's like to be in God's character. 
And so what does this mean? It means we're called to show mercy wherever we go. When we're at our jobs and our boss just seems like the most heartless person, we're called to show mercy. When we're on the road and that person cuts us off at the most inconvenient time, mercy. When it feels like our kids have just completely lost it and they didn't listen to a, complete, a single word we just said, mercy, right? This is what we're called to do. Yes, sometimes we have to get people's attention and say, hey, look, what you're doing is hurting this relationship for us. But yet, even before that, we're called to show mercy. That's the character of God that God says, this is first of who I am in Deuteronomy. He starts off with saying, I'm a merciful God. And this is the character I think that we are called to live first. Before judgment, before we hate others, before we do anything else, we're called to show mercy to the people around us. And this is what it happens. We start showing the relationship that God has for us. We start being that living example of what it's like to be a relationship to others. I think back to like my call to missions at Olivet. They like to tell us, you know, when you meet people for the first time, they might not even know what it's like to be in a loving relationship with a human being. So how are they ever supposed to know what it's like to be in a loving relationship with God? So it starts with us showing mercy and love to those around us so they can better understand who God is because we're called to live in God's character and the top priority in God's character is mercy. So I'd like to end today as I'm wrapping up with a psalm. Psalm 130, and it says this. Out of the depths I have cried to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the sound of my pleadings. If you, Lord, were to keep an account of all my guilties, who could even stand, Lord? But yet there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and I wait for his word. My soul waits in hope for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Yes, more than the watchman for the morning. Israel, wait for the Lord. For with the Lord there is what? Mercy. There's mercy. And with him is abundant redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his guilty deeds. So church, I don't know where you're at today, but for the people of Israel, God was about to be done with them. They have just broken God's heart. And yet, God says, I love you. I'm, I'm going to show mercy to you. So I don't know what you're going through today. Maybe you just like feel burnt out. And you're like, I'm trying, God, but I don't know what to do next. Guess what? That same God wants to show you mercy and love. So this is the God we serve, church. Amen. It doesn't matter how much you feel like you've broken the heart of God or how distant you feel, we serve a God of mercy. And this is the God that we serve today. Amen, church. Let's pray. God, thank you for the love that you've poured out for us. Thank you for being a God that doesn't just say, you know what, I'm done with you. He says, you know what, no, I'm not done. This is just the beginning. God, people, I, you just love us so much that you can't just help, but your heart breaks for us. And you say, no, just come back with me. Let's keep going on this journey. God, I pray as a people that we would fall into a relationship with you. That we would be so overcome by your mercy and love that we can't just help but continue to live that out to those that we see around us. That every time we walk into a person that we are so overcome by your mercy and love that we can't just help overflow into the interactions we have daily, God. Would we become a living sacrifice, a living testimony to who you are, God? Would our characteristics be modeled to you and let us show mercy above all else? It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. As the praise team comes and gets ready, I just want to open the altar up for family altar time. That's what we do here at our church. And Caleb did another version of what we've been saying. You want to go all in? It takes a real relationship with Jesus Christ. And what this world needs more than anything else is Christians who are all in where they have so much of God that everything else is secondary. And when the world sees you, they see Jesus. Amen? That's what they need, and that's what we need. Take it to a deeper level. My friends, there's a lot going on. Those of you watching online, there's a lot going on in your life. 
There's someone who's not here today who hasn't missed for a long time, but now they're in that stage of life where they can no longer attend. And it breaks our hearts, but at the other end is God. And I was thinking of that song, I'm going to see a victory. That's what's awaiting her. When we have to stop doing what we want down here, God has something better. And if you've got this relationship with God, you know there's something better. And so church today, we've got a lot to pray about. There's a lot going on in this world that wasn't happening just a little while ago. But it's happening now. There's a lot going on in our lives. I'm inviting you, church, to come and talk to God about it. Talk about your relationship with him. Talk about someone else's relation. Talk about someone else's issues. Bring these prayer requests, these burdens, to the God who loves you and is merciful. Let's give him some time this morning at family altar time. As we stand together, they're going to be singing a song about who God is, Christ alone. And as they do, respond to that Christ and your relationship with him.
Lord, we just bow in your presence today. We thank you. You are here. You hear our cries. You love us through our stuff. And we are so grateful for that kind of God. How many times did the people of Israel fail you and you still love them? Just like the parable said, then you sent your son. <laughs> you had the prophets, you had all the other, but then you sent your son with a message and they killed even the son and you still love them. And Lord, you love us today with all of our wrinkles, with all of our garbage, with all of our stuff, you still love us. The devil is telling somebody here this morning that God doesn't love you. You've done too much. You've gone too far. That's a lie because God loves you. Lord, thank you for loving us, for being that kind of God. Love us back into the kingdom we pray. And so, Lord, we surrender to your love today. We admit we need your love. So change us from the inside out. Make us who we need to be. We will become more like Christ. And someday, we will live with you forever. Thank you, Lord, for this time of family altar and time of sharing in this worship service. We love you. Help us now as we worship you. And Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy of our worship. Amen. How great the
doing this, but would you all please sit? <sighs> we have Olivet Nazarene University represented by three ambassadors today. This is our regional school. We're so glad to have this college. It puts something in your heart to know that there's Christians going to come back to churches to serve Jesus Christ, doesn't it? And God is calling them and equipping them to do what God has laid on their heart to do. And normally we don't do this because preaching ambassadors is funded, but music ambassadors is not. And we need to take up a special love offering for them and uh, so that they can get back home, <laughs> back to Olivet. Um, so we're gonna do that at this time, take up a love offering for them. They have a video that advertises Olivet Nazarene University. By the way, our own Phoenix Parks is there. So. <laughs> This university means a lot. He was home last weekend, and uh, it means a lot to us um, as, as Nazarenes, but to these guys, it is their way to ministry. And so we, are, we also have one that graduated in 67 from Olivet. She's over there on the organ, anyway. She was bragging to them last night, I'm an Olivetian too, so I, I just figured she might as well get, get that little tab in for, for Mary Sue. And um, so the ushers are coming, we're going to take a love offering for them, and then um, a, a video is going to play, and then we will uh, have one more worship song, so don't leave yet, they're going to do one more for us. Let's pray. Lord, you just bless this offering, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, we'll dismiss you guys in some praise. Y'all have a good week. Yes. Have the best week. Blessed by the Lord. We'll see you guys.